firing chain is armed. On November 16, 2009, Space Shuttle Atlantis launched STS-129 to the International Space Station. Six, five, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Houston now controlling. Atlantis begins its penultimate journey to shore up the International Space Station. Atlantis now on the proper alignment for its eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Four and a half million pounds of hardware and humans taking aim on the international outpost. 30 seconds into the flight, Atlantis almost two miles in altitude, almost six miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center already, traveling 500 miles an hour. Three liquid fuel main engines now throttling back to 72% of rated performance going into the bucket, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. 55 seconds into the flight, all systems operating normally, 900 miles an hour. The speed of Atlantis right now, six miles in altitude, nine miles downrange. Atlantis, go with throttle up. Copy, go with throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Charlie Hobaugh, joined on the flight deck by pilot Butch Wilmore, flight engineer Randy Bresnick and Leland Melvin, seated down on the mid deck are Mike Foreman and Bobby Satcher, kicking off their work week with a Monday commute to orbit. One minute, 30 seconds into the flight, Atlantis 13 miles in altitude, 15 miles downrange, traveling almost 2,000 miles an hour. Three good auxiliary power units, three good fuel cells, three good main engines. One minute, 50 seconds into the flight, 10 seconds away from solid rocket booster separation. It doesn't matter how old you are, this is uh, just an incredible ride and uh, you got a smile on your face going the whole way. It's an impressive vehicle, it's four and a half millions on, mil million pounds on the pad. Seven million pounds of thrust waiting to get you off. The solids come off at about 150,000 feet. And if you have a normal launch, which we had, the next significant event is the uh, roll to heads up, which happens about Mach 13. Coming up next here. Just a beautiful sight. The vehicle rolled. I was on the right side, so it rolled where I could see the ground. I could see from about New York City to the southern tip of Florida from about 300,000 feet. What a beautiful sight it was, and eventually we hit main engine cutoff and the, we separate from the tank. After achieving orbit, the crew of STS-129 used the orbital boom sensor system to check Atlantis for damage sustained on launch. None was found. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit on November 18, 2009, Atlantis approached the station. STS-129 Commander Charles Hoba perform the rendezvous pitch maneuver to check the underside of Atlantis. Rendezvous pitch maneuver is uh, standard these days to look at the under, underbelly of the vehicle. We had a, uh, you know, sometimes you're just lucky, sometimes you're good. I think uh, we're just lucky. You get uh, through the pitch maneuver and if the station's centered up, it uh, makes for a pretty sweet shot sometimes. Uh, it tends to wander off. Uh, station is uh, just an incredible uh, size. It's impressive to see it. And uh, here we go uh, putting things back to normal speed. Atlantis then approached the station and docked while the station and shuttle were over Australia. Three, you're getting there, get ready. Mark. Out the window. Yep, out the window. Ready, ready, one one when I saw them both. Ready with the timer? Ready. Got that. Coasting okay. in, coasting in. 18 inches. Mark. 
nine inches. Ready? Two inches. Fire. It's the initial contact got captured. Capture. Station East Atlantis capture confirmed. No free drift yet. Still steady light. After opening the hatches, the traditional welcome ceremony and the station safety briefing followed, and the shuttle and the station crews began their joint operations for the rest of the day. Later in the day, the shuttle's robotic arm, operated by mission specialists Melvin and Bresnik, lifted the Express Logistics Carrier 1 out of the payload bay. It was handed over to the station's Canadarm Arm 2, controlled by shuttle pilot Wilmore and station flight engineer Williams, and it was attached to the P-3 truss. Mission Specialists Michael Foreman and Robert Satcher spent the night in the Quest airlock as part of the overnight campout procedure to help them get prepared for the next day's spacewalk. On November 29, 2009, Foreman and Satcher conducted EVA-1, completing all activities with hours to spare, giving them time to perform get-ahead tasks. Towards the end of EVA-1, while deploying the payload attached system on the Earth-facing side of S3 truss, the crew had difficulty loosening a steel bolt and removing a diagonal brace on the PAS. After hammering on a bolt and wiggling the brace, they finally successfully deployed the PAS and reinstalled the brace. On November 20th, Atlantis Commander Charles Hoba and Mission Specialist Leland Melvin used the shuttle's robotic arm to grasp the express logistics carrier, the ELC-2, located in Atlantis's payload bay. Inside the station's Unity node, crew members also completed the two-day task of outfitting the node. They routed a slew of cables, hoses, and fluid lines to prepare for the arrival of the Tranquility node aboard STS-130, the next scheduled shuttle mission. On November 21st, the mission's second spacewalk, EVA-2, was conducted by astronauts Foreman and Bresnik. Again, the spacewalking pair finished all their assigned work way ahead of timeline, with no major problems, so they completed several get-ahead tasks originally scheduled for the mission's third spacewalk. November 22, 2009 was a special day when the team got some exciting news from Bresnik who reported the birth of his daughter, Abigail May Bresnik, that Saturday. On November 23rd, the crew conducted the third and final spacewalk conducted by astronauts Satcher and Bresnik. Working ahead of schedule most of the time, the two mission specialists completed all primary jobs they were assigned and all the get-ahead tasks that had been added to their timeline. On November 24, 2009, the shuttle boosted the station's orbit about 1.5 kilometers, and the crew completed the transfer of cargo from the shuttle to the station. Atlantis and the station crews also joined together for a traditional news conference with reporters at NASA centers, Mission Control in Russia and Canada, and TF1 Evening News in France. During the news conference, Expedition 21 astronaut Robert Thirsk said the space station is now nearly complete, and it was almost 86% the way finished. Aboard the Destiny Laboratory, shortly after the joint crew photo, Frank DeWin, the first European Space Agency commander of the space station, handed over his command to astronaut Jeff Williams. The change of command ceremony was the first of its kind during a shuttle mission on the ISS. At 17 hours and 43 minutes universal coordinated time, Atlantis astronauts bid farewell to the station's crew inside the Harmony module and crossed the threshold into the shuttle. The hatches between the space shuttle and the International Space Station were closed at 1812 UTC in preparation for Atlantis's undocking. With hatch closure, they ended five days, 23 hours, and 44 minutes of joint time between Atlantis and the station crews. The next day, November 25th, Atlantis this undocked from the station. station TCS is good. Okay. The panels are clear, I got LBLH. Starting to back away slowly. Eventually we get out to about 400 feet and we start to do a loop completely around the station, 360 degrees. It takes place of roughly 600 feet from the station. 
And uh, the guy that's flying it has the worst view because everybody's got to get up and take pictures and see the views. And After separating to a distance of 450 feet, Atlantis then flew around the station, taking photos and videos. The beauty of station, there's a little panoramic down below as we uh, execute our fly around a little sped up. And the station is, is just absolutely beautiful with the sparkling silver and the contrast of the gold solar rays. The detail, you look at this and you think that the literally hundreds of thousands of man hours put into on the ground preparing this vehicle to go up to space piece by piece. In a beautiful, beautiful sight it is. They then performed the final separation burn. After two days in orbit on November 27, 2009, Atlantis deorbited and re-entered the atmosphere and landed on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center shuttle landing facility. It was the last shuttle of the 2000s. Uh, actually hit the number, uh, but taking out that uh, eight and a half minute ride of 3G acceleration up to that speed, trying to slow down by uh, burning halfway around the earth uh, to re-enter. Uh, coming up the coast of Florida, beautiful clear day. Uh, and here I am, I'm actually a Harrier guy where I'm, I actually stop first and then land. And so here we are whipping by at 300 knots. I'm trying to figure out how we uh, land then stop. Butch did his job, he got the gear down, thank goodness. Uh, and the shoot, we end up uh, rolling to a stop down in front of uh, a very happy crowd that gets to see the, uh, the vehicle that they did such a great job preparing uh, arrive back to them the day after Thanksgiving so they can start working for STS-132 to get this thing prepped again. Less than two hours from now to begin the ride home for Roman Romanenko. Frank Duena and Bob Thursk. On December 1st, 2009, Soyuz TMA-15, which had been docked to the Nadir port of Zarya since May 29th, 2009, undocked to free up the port for Soyuz TMA-17. Aboard the Soyuz was Expedition 20 and 21 crew Roman Romanenko, Frank Duena, and Robert Thursk. After undocking, Soyuz TMA-15 returned to Kazakhstan with no issues. For the period of about two weeks, only Expedition 21 crew Jeff Williams and Max Suryev were aboard the ISS. On December 20th, 2009, Soyuz TMA-17 launched atop a Soyuz FG carrier rocket from Baikonur Cosmodrome. Inside were three members of the Expedition 22 crew, Oleg Kotov, Timothy Kremer, and Japanese astronaut Soichi Naguchi. Soyuz TMA-17 docked to the Nadir port of Zarya, the last plan to do so before the Rosvet module would be docked to that port in an upcoming shuttle mission. On the exterior of the Soyuz vehicle, we have moved into uh, an orbital sunset just off the east coast of Brazil. Both spacecraft are flying 220 miles above the Earth, moving from south... On January 14, 2010, cosmonauts Oleg Katov and Maxim Suryev conducted a spacewalk to outfit the Poisk module to prepare for receiving Soyuz and Progress ships. They deployed antennas and a docking target, installed two handrails, and plugged the new module's KERS antennas into the KERS docking system circuitry. The spacewalk lasted 5 hours and 44 minutes. On January 21, 2010, cosmonauts Matt Suryev and Expedition 22 Commander Jeff Williams relocated Soyuz from the aft end of the Svezda 
to the new Poisk module. Okay, so when, okay, just report to us when you have the On February 3rd, 2010, Progress M04M was launched by a Soyuz U carrier rocket from Site 15 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. After just over three days of free flight, Progress M04M docked with the Svezda module on the International Space Station on February 5th, 2010. Progress M04M delivered 2,686 kilograms of cargo to the ISS, included water, propellant, food, and medical supplies. The docking of Progress M04M marked the first time four Russian spacecraft had been docked to the station at the same time. Next up for the station would be the addition of the Tranquility Module and the now infamous Cupola on STS-130.